Hey guys, and welcome back to a new Kotlin video. In this video, I will show you the new context parameters feature of Kotlin and some very, very, very cool practical use cases for it. If you're seeing this, then there are probably only about 12 hours left to save 30% on all my courses and bundles, including the new Kotlin full stack developer bundle that has just launched. Teachers, KMP, Compose, Multi Platform, Multi Module Architecture, all that. Link is below. Well, let's get into context parameters here. Context parameters is a new Kotlin feature that is still in preview. If there is a feature that is in preview, then that means we also need to opt into that. That is what we'll do here. Depending on when you watch this video, you may not need to do this anymore when using a Kotlin version that already has this built in. But if you are following along uh, approximately at the same time where I upload this video, then you need to go to your uh, build at Gradle file. This here, by the way, is a, a KMP project, but this will work just the same way in a native Android project, in a plain uh, Kotlin native project, whatever, or uh, Kotlin JVM, of course, as well. All in all, we just need to open the Gradle file and then you have this Kotlin block where you define compiler options because we just need to add a compiler flag to tell the compiler, hey, we want to use this new feature. And this works by saying free compiler args dot add and we want to add dash x context parameters. And then we synchronize this and then we have access to this feature. Let's first of all understand what this really brings and what it's all about. Because this is really what I think is one of the cooler features that have been released to Kotlin in, in the last while. So let's go to a common main to whatever kind of a Kotlin code base you have here and create a plain file here. Maybe just call this utility, utility, like there's a file. And we have a function here, for example, hello world. And then we have another function, do something really just as the very first simple example so you understand what this feature is really about. So of course, if we have two such Kotlin functions, we can call one of them in the other function. But this new feature actually brings a new keyword that we can apply on a function or a class. And here we are obviously at a function, so we can say context and that you will see it will be marked as a new keyword and we can provide context on a specific value, on a specific object dependency. For example, a string. We can say my string is string and then we can do something here with the string, for example, printing it. However, the moment we do this, you will see we get an error here because it says no context argument for a string found. And at this point, this is really not much different than passing parameter, just that passing this parameter works a little bit differently. So while we could of course say this my string is passed here in this function as a parameter, then it would also complain here, uh, but we could simply say the string here that we want to print is hello world. If we omit this parameter and we instead pass it as a so-called context parameter, like we did before, then passing that parameter actually works differently. So we can simply put it here in the function. But what Kotlin wants in this case, it wants context on a string object here at the place where we call this function. What does context mean here? Context means that the this keyword reference or is able to reference a string in the current context. So this could reference the current class instance we're in. So if we have a normal class here, class, my class, and uh, we call some code in here and say this, you can see this references this my class here. And that means if this my string here wouldn't, for example, be a string, but an instance of my class, and we then call do something here, then now we suddenly don't have to pass a parameter for this my class instance, but we also don't get an error because we call this function in a context where a my class instance is available. So you can already see in certain cases where we maybe call a function multiple times in a class, we can use this to avoid having to pass this parameter over and over again to these function calls. But that is actually rather a smaller advantage of this new feature in my opinion. We will come to much cooler features of this uh, context parameters here in a moment. However, now that we actually, let's actually rename this my class, because we now work with that instance. Uh, if we now actually want to be able to call this here, and let's say we would have a my class instance. So we have an instance of this class, we instantiate that here, then how would we actually be able to pass this my class here as a context to this function? Because here we are not inside of this class, so this doesn't reference a my class instance, so we need a different way around that. And one way to do this is the Kotlin with function. So we can say with my class, and then here in this code, this will reference this my class. And that means if we now move our function call in here, that suddenly works. But what this already shows is that in certain contexts, this is rather messy. So this is definitely not better and not clearer than just passing this my class instance here as a parameter. 
In this case, it could be clearer because we don't need to pass this parameter since we already have this here and it is implicitly inferred from the compiler. So under the hood, the compiler will just make this a normal function parameter, but for us here on the development end, that is not what we need to pass. We're also not limited to a single context parameter, so we can define multiple ones here. So we can again bring up our uh, string here, my string. Then we now get errors here at both places because now our code wants context on both these types of objects here at the place where we call this function. And here at this point, it's actually able to find context from this my class instance for the first context parameter, but not for the string. If we would now say with, for example, and we pass a string here and call this in here, then it suddenly works again because this can reference both a string or a my class instance in this current context. But let's come to much more cool use cases here that also have something to do with the real world. For example, when it comes to view models, something we very often work with on Android, on Kotlin multi-platform projects. So let's get rid of all that. I think that is clear. We create something like a my view model instance here. So just those kinds of containers that include our state mapping logic for a specific screen, for example. Then in here we may have something like a state, mutable state flow. We could make this uh, some kind of my state that holds maybe a counter integer zero initially. And then we default initialize, oops, default initialize that my state here. But let's say we now want to have an immutable variant of that state that we expose to the UI. We say that's equal to state. And we also want to do something the moment the UI starts collecting that flow. So we say on start, this is a flow operator that will simply trigger the moment the UI or some kind of collector will start listening to emissions of this, this flow, will start listening to changes of the state. But now this state here is actually not a state flow anymore because normal flow operators like on start transform what was previously a mutable state flow or a normal state flow will transform that to just a normal so-called cold flow. If we now want to expose this as a state flow to the UI again, we need to call the state in operator. So state in will simply take a cold flow, a normal flow, and transform that into a hot flow, in this case, a state flow. And if this is a bit confusing for you, then really don't worry about these flow concepts here since the, the whole point and what I want to show here with uh, context parameters will get clear regardless of this flow stuff. It's just a practical example that you will face often uh, in real world pro projects. So here we would on the one hand need to pass a coroutine scope. Well, since we're on a view model, we can pass the view model scope. And that comes from this view model here. That is not available outside of view models. But we also need to typically pass this sharing started while subscribed value here. So that means while there are actually subscribers of this flow, this flow chain here will stay active, will keep on executing. And if the last subscriber disappears, then for five more seconds, this flow chain here will execute. This five seconds here in the end come from an, an Android internal detail, uh, specifically the ANR window application not responding. But that's a different topic. It's just something you very often have to do when calling state in in your view models. And lastly, you need to pass an initial value. So the initial value of your state, which is our my state instance in this case. And this is something you very often not have to do just once in your project, but very, very often. Now you could imagine, let's actually extract that in a helper function. So we don't need to pass that many values. Well, what we can do here is, since the state in function is being called on a normal flow here, since on start returns a normal flow, and that normal flow should be converted to a state flow. You could now think, okay, let's make this an extension function Kotlin. We would have something like a generic type T. We extend any type of flow here and we call this, I'll enter to import that, and we call this something like state in while subscribed. And then that will return a state flow of exactly that flows type T. And here we could then return this. So the flow that we call this function on, we call state in, we pass a coroutine scope, but oh, here, uh, view model scope is actually not passable. Hmm. Sharing started, that is something where we say while well subscribed because that's typically the value you want to have in view models. So that is something we can actually put in here. And well, initial value we also don't have here. So there are two values now that we don't have. Honestly, the initial value can be really, really different across calls. So here it makes sense to actually pass this as a parameter. So initial value of that type T. So that is resolved. But when calling this function, we actually almost always call this in the context of a view model. And in the context of a view model, we also have access to a view model scope. However, with Kotlin's previous extension functions, which we made use of here, we can only extend a single property. We could, of course, also extend the view model here, and then the view model scope would be resolved. 
but the state in wouldn't be resolved anymore because <laughs> this function doesn't know that it is being called on some kind of flow. <laughs> so we would technically have to pass the flow now as a parameter. But that is also not very beautiful because then we didn't save a lot since we still need to pass two of those three values here to our custom function. So let's leave it at the flow and rather make use of context parameters because if we now say additionally, we have context on a view model reference of any type of view model that has view model scope, then we can reference that here. View model, that view model scope, and that now works. So context parameters in the end allow us to kind of extend multiple properties at once. So while we still want this function to only be callable on a flow, we also only want it to be callable in the context of a view model. So if we now say state in while subscribed, and we just pass in the initial value, then this is all we now need to type across the project because the view model scope is inferred from the context. This can only be called in a context where we have this view model, where this would reference the view model. And it can also only be called on a flow of any type of value. That is exactly what we work with here. And this is something that previously wasn't possible, except if you wanted to pass an additional parameter. But then you didn't win a lot. But let me get to another very useful example. And let's put this in a separate file. I will call this async util, make this a file. And well, if you're a little bit into Kotlin coroutines and we have a suspend function like here, for example, that we call on an iterable of any type t again, so we can again make this generic. We say for each, let's say async, and they want to do a certain uh, thing here for each item. So we get this t here. So we really just want to have this iterable. So just some kind of data structure we can iterate over, be it a list, an array, something like that. If we now say, okay, we take this iter iterable and we iterate normally over it with for each and then invoke our action lambda with that current item, and let's say this is actually a suspending lambda, then this is not really async because we are in a suspending function and this will first iterate over the first item. Then once that is done, and has been processed, the second item, third item, and so on. Very often, we actually want to process all these items in parallel, so concurrently. That is the main reason why we have something like coroutines in the first place and multi-threading. However, in order to make use of that with coroutines, we actually need a coroutine scope, because only in a coroutine scope, we can launch independent coroutines that don't have to wait for each other. So we could, of course, now say again, we extend a coroutine scope instead, but then we miss the context on this iterable and we would have to pass the iterable, so the list array or whatever, here as a parameter. And that again defeats the purpose a little bit since we need to pass quite a lot of values. So what we can do is we can make this a context parameter again. We say we pass a coroutine scope. So we can only call this inside of a coroutine scope. And then here we simply say instead of action, we put this action in a launch block, actually scope.launch. And the moment we say scope.launch, we effectively execute this piece of code here asynchronously. And now, if we are here in a view model, for example, and we <laughs> launch a coroutine, view model scope.launch, then here we can now call for each, uh, actually on a list, of course. So we have a list, my list, the list of one, two, and three. And then we can say my list for each async. And this now works because we are inside of a coroutine scope. And this, again, references this coroutine scope here, specifically the view model scope. So what we now put in here will iterate over this list, but process each item asynchronously. Same thing would work for mapping items, for example. So we can copy paste this function. We make this maybe a suspending function here, since mapping actually needs to wait for all the results, but it can map each item independently. We say map async. We have a certain map lambda. Well, let's actually call it, let's call it action. Uh, so we don't have a naming conflict here. So we have suspending lambdas that map a certain type T to any other type R, which we then return here. So we return an iterable of type R here. So we have an iterable of type T and we map this to a different type of iterable of type R, whatever these types are. Therefore, this lambda here also needs to return our type R. And then we could say, return this, so our iterable, that map, and in map, we say scope.async to launch an independent coroutine that holds a result in this case, so the result of this action lambda. We call this action lambda with the current item we are mapping, and then we call await all. And this will map all these items here in parallel, wait for all these to complete, but it won't do this sequentially anymore. Same thing we could now do here. So my list, and we could say, um, maybe, <laughs> I don't know, squared, we say my list dot map async, and we map this to 
the square of each number. And this would now be mapped in parallel. So this really just as some ideas of what you can use this new feature for. It is, in my opinion, really most useful if you need to kind of uh, write an extension function for two or more properties at once, like we did here. If you don't extend a certain property here and you use context parameters, then I would only do that if you really need to call it in context multiple times. So if you know a function that is defined somewhere else needs to be called in a specific class, for example, multiple times, then making this a context parameter can really save you some typing because you don't need to uh, pass these parameters explicitly all the time. But I would be careful with flooding your code base with these new context parameters, because in many cases, there is no difference to you passing a parameter as a context parameter versus a normal parameter. So the moment you actually have to, have to use this with block in order to pass this context parameter and use this over and over again, then it may make more sense to actually make this just a normal parameter and not having to define this with block all the time. But this is really a feature that I will use more often in future when it's really um, included in the language in the stable version. So when we don't need to opt into that, let me know down below what you think about this. And as I mentioned, really, really last chance to get the Kotlin full stack developer bundle with a Kotlin multi-platform course, with a Compose multi-platform course, multi-module architecture, chat app, all that stuff in 56 hours of video material. 30% less, also 30% less on all other bundles, the ultimate bundle, including all my courses. Link below, 12 hours left. Thanks for watching. I will see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye.